Okay, so welcome to the panel number 37, Environmental Philosophy and Contemporary Bioethics. And this is um, the last panel before our keynote address. So this is the very last panel in our whole conference. Sabishi desu ne. Yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah I'm hoping to have very deep discussion in the very last. <laughs> so our first uh, speaker is Lina Droth from the Kyoto University, and she is a master's student, and she is going to talk on give a talk on what is this conception of the self and the basis of ethics of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you to be here. So I'm very honored to present today, and I'm really waiting for all your criticism and questions. So, please be feel free to fire up. <laughs> so, yeah. So, in order to try to do this, there are four points I need to, to for questions. I need to answer first why the conception of the self lies at the basic of an ethic of sustainability. Then I will present some key concept of Watsuji Tetsuro about the self and the historical milieu, and my interpretation of them, and some criticism too. And then uh, some usual problem of the theorization of sustainability and how we can try to answer this problem. Uh, inspired by the conception of what you did Tetsuro. There are four phases here. So first, it's, it might sound quite obvious, but why the conception of the self lies at the basis of ethical sustainability? So it's because I think we can say that the global environmental crisis is caused by mainstream belief in capitalist theories of economic growth and consumption. And these theories are based on conception of the self as homo economicus and of the environment as objectifiable resources. And there is also an underlying <coughs> dualism here. Dualism, uh, human nature, and but also body, mind, and so on. And <coughs> the logic of dualism has many aspects. And one of them is the denial of dependency of human to the environment and the radical exclusion of each other. A hierarchization with culture higher than culture, uh, culture higher than nature, and instrumentalism in stereotyping. But that's kind of the problem. And another aspect um, why the self is important is because in our day, our contemporary age, uh, individuals as consumer and citizen, they are at the core of decision making for sustainable lifestyle. There is a global kind of weakening of statism. And so we have to see what is the self, to interest ourselves on what is the self, I think. Then about Watsuji, I, will, I didn't read everything of Watsuji, right? And I'm still beginning, so I will focus on these three uh, works. Uh, so Ethics as the Study of Human Being, Fudo and uh, Rinigaku. On Fudo, I will mainly focus on the first chapter. Right. Uh, yes. So the conception of the self that we can find in Watsuji has many aspects on his, well, he's starting uh, the three works I presented just before by an etymological analysis of Ningen and Rinri. And so it's integrating AIDA, the relation, the, the space which allows the meeting and contact between peoples, as inside the definition of what it is to be human. And ethics is emerging from this relation to, between human beings. Like in the Rin, the Rin Ligaku, uh, yeah, Rin. And so there is also a rejection of dualism mind-body with the concept of shin, shin which is not only in Watsuji, of course, and the idea of ki, which is constantly flowing. I think we discussed this in other panels, so I don't want to go there. And this is also in convergence with the contemporary uh, neurosciences and cognitive sciences uh, with the inactive conception of the self. So the self is relational, and, but I'm not going to stay too long here, but... Um, yeah, so... This quotation is um, saying that uh, there is, we cannot have this individual without having the relation, and we cannot never have the relation without having two individuals. So there is, none of them is preceding the other. So it's really intrinsically linked. It's a bit like the question of the egg and the chicken. Right. So another aspect is that the self is ever-changing. 
it's built in a constant cycles, dynamic cycle of negating the self here by recognizing its community with the world. So kind of recognizing the interdependence and sameness with the other, including with nature. And then negating the negation by coming back to the self and recognizing our in independence, freedom, and agency. And these cycles are constant. As long as we are alive, we are in constant cycles of becoming through this uh, identification and coming back to the agency. And these cycles are made possible by the betweenness, Aida which is also uh, for some author like Kulazis, the emptiness, right? And this space is making possible the encounter of the other and the uh, creation of the meaning. And so it's also there that uh, emerges the communal imaginary, right, of, uh, which helps us to make sense of our life and our environment, our milieu. So, right, so the self is always becoming. So when I speak about Watsuji in Japan, I have always two criticisms which uh, come up. One is that he is collectivist, and so that think about the conception of the self might be a bit problematic, and the other is uh, natural determinism. So uh, here, to answer to the object of, of collectivism, it's true that in some passage, it, it seems that Watsuji is getting stuck on the uh, uh, dissolution of the self in the uh, community, and he also tends to have a hierarchical perspective on putting the collectivity higher, more important than the individual. So I think it's important really to keep in mind these two aspects of difference and reciprocity. So difference, it's very important to keep because um, if we don't acknowledge the difference of the other, we cannot uh, respond well to their needs because the other doesn't have the same kind of needs of us. And this is especially true if you think about the environment, right? So we really need to go back to the self and uh, think about, recognize the difference with the other. And reciprocity is important also to avoid this hierarchization and uh, sacrifice of the individual for the community. We always need to have a recognition of the interdependence and kind of equality. I don't like this. I mean, same level of thinking. Right? Then, um, I, in the first chapter of Fudo, I think it's clear that uh, what you did this Fudo re reject natural determinism. So it's especially clear in the quotation that I will directly go to my synthesis. So he is developing the idea of milieu instead of environment. And so if the environment is usually passive around the subject, it's also the scientific perspective artificially objectified of our, what's around us and also ourselves, the body. And it's measurable and neutral and so on. The milieu is more co-determined by uh, the communal imaginary, by us. So it's a web of signification, and it's lived by a subjective a relational individual. So it's also corresponding with the coupling, coupling we have in cognitive senses of perception, action, always this cycle. Uh, and we have the now here as a structural moment of human existence, which is containing the past and the future. It's the uh, key word of uh, Ningen Sosaido Kozo Keiki, where so we, we don't have a differentiation with temporality, but the time of who we will become and who we were in the past are present in what we are now. And not only as individual, but also as community. So if we think like this, we can have a direct link with sustainability. This is also through the concept of historicity. And that's my favorite passage in, in what I read about Watsuji, with the quotation here that's um, the individual dies, the relation between individuals changes, but while dying and changing, individuals live and their betweenness continue. And that, I think, might be a key point to address some of the uh, temporal distance problems of sustainability. And what, what is continuing in this betweenness in more contemporary world, we can think of the cultural imaginary, what we uh, but the impact we had in the environment, in our milieu during our life, is staying there after we die. Because we had an impact on the perception of the world, uh, of the community. So then, uh, usually in, when we try to theorize sustainability, there are three main problems we have here in uh, environmental ethics, uh, analytic environmental ethics. The first one is the problem of knowledge, that there is an intrinsic uncertainty, and high complexity and limited time. Oh yes, maybe 
I'm thinking always at the environmental ethical individual decision making. Right? So we can, for example, uh, when we buy food, we need to think, of, if we need to think of all the consequences, we don't eat anymore because we have to eat, we have, so we have to think at very complex problem in very limited time. Then the second problem is the problem of spatial distance because we are not in direct communication with victims, potential victims of our actions, the consequences of our action, which can be, I mean, uh, human and natural, of course. And the problem of temporal distance on future generation, which is divided in three aspects. The first one is the contingency of existence. This is direct benefit ID, that everything we change today will have an impact on what individual will live in the future. So we don't have anybody worse off. In the determinacy of needs, because we cannot know what individual uh, future generation will need, because they don't exist, we cannot ask them. Uh, and asymmetry of power, because now we have uh, we are completely powerful to the management of resources, so they cannot say anything if we use all the resources now. Right. Uh, so then I will try to answer to each, provide a short answer to each of them. So the problem of knowledge is too complicated, and I cannot answer to this. But uh, I think that if we uh, think as the very local level, a local milieu, usually people are develop an ident process and identification with the local environment, the very local milieu, and they be, uh, develop also a kind of attachment to it. And so they will tend to know better how it's working. They will tend to um, notice changes. And so maybe on the local, very localized level, they can have uh, knowledge about the milieu. And, so adopt a lifestyle which is, at the local level, more sustainable. It's also working with the not-in-my-bike-yard problem, but in a good way. <laughs> then the problem of spatial distance, I think there are three reasons for the relational individual to care for the global milieu. The first one is the recognition of the interconnectedness of nature. So this is not depending on uh, milieu or relational individual, just, for example, between uh, the problem of haze problem between Singapore and uh, what, Indonesia. That I'm sure that people in Singapore they are very well aware of the interconnectedness of nature because what's happening in Indonesia with the burning of the forest is having a direct impact on their air pollution. And then uh, the care for other human being, which is reported on the milieu. So for example, if I have a friend who is coming from another part of the world, I've never been there. But if I want, if I care for the person, I will have to care for its milieu, for where he lived in the past and where he is living now, he or she, because uh, it's part of who this person is, it's part of its identity. So like this, we can also spread our care to the, for the milieu outside of our direct experience, beyond our direct experience. And finally, the awareness of the commonness of nature is to play with the scale of identity towards the air citizen, but this might be more difficult to accomplish. Then the problem of temporal distance. We can have a free answer to each of these problems. First, the asymmetry of power. There is also the symmetry view, right? Which is that future generations, they have power over our posthumous reputation and success or failure of our project. So if we think about the historical milieu as part of who we are, it's getting, this is getting much more important because future generations, they will determine what is left of this part of ourselves, which is our historical milieu, right? So it's no more asymmetrical of power, it's different kind of power, but we can have a symmetry view here. Then the problem of contingency of existence is especially true when we need somebody worse off in our ethical system to have an ethical action. But if the ethical value is no more attached to a particular non not yet existent and potentially suffering individuals, but to the significance of the historical milieu itself, who exactly will exist in this future uh, historical milieu is less really less important because what is important is the survival of the his significance of the historical milieu. And then the interdeterminacy of needs, I think this is true, of course, in very long term. We cannot have any ID, but most of the problem, environmental problem we are facing today, sadly, it's not so long term. It can be only a few hundred years. And in a few hundred years, we can guess that people have same basic needs, of course, and also as we transmit to the future generation our historical milieu, our interpretation of the world and who we are and so on, we can guess that 
these people will, of course, reinterpret, but they will base their interpretation of what we gave them. So we can kind of suspect that their interpretation of basic needs or needs will not be so different from ours right now. So from this perspective, the sustainability becomes the conservation of a living, meaningful milieu. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we can have here the, the idea of medial duty from Berk, and uh, he's saying here that we have a medial duty to commit ourselves consciously to respect all the beings of the milieu as they are necessary, uh, not sufficient of course, for the emergence of our own consciousness and freedom through these cycles, right, of uh, assimilation and go back to the agency. And then, this I'm making a lot of, a lot of jump, but so I'm trying to reinterpret the conception uh, that we saw uh, in the uh, global workspace theory in cognitive sciences to see how we are making decisions, uh, well, how do we are making decisions. So in there is in the global workspace theory, I don't know, maybe you know about it, but we would have the higher dominant context, which would be no more the homo economicus, but more a relational self. And this higher dominant context is uh, the mainly unconscious, how we make decisions, but unconsciously. Then we have, would have a goal context, which is survival, of course. But in order to survive, we need sustainability. So sustainability would be present here, clearly. And the conceptual context would become the milieu, historical milieu, the recognition that the environment is not objectified, but that is meaningful through the construction of the communal communality. And in this context, we are in this set of context, hierarchical context, we are taking decisions. And so, right. So my hypothesis here is that if we keep this concept context in mind, of logically all, it follows that um, our decisions will be more sustainable right? because we have to recognize all this interdependency also. And finally, to conclude, um, so I like this quote of Plumwood, who is an environmental ethicist of care, who is saying that on this relational account, respect for the other results neither from the containment of the self, so staying here, uh, neither nor from a transcendence of the self, so kind of saying assimilated there, uh, but in an expression of the self in a relationship, not at egoistic, as merged with the other, neither, but the self as embedded in a network of essential relationships with distinct others. So we would have these cycles of Watsuji, ever-ending cycles of recognition of our commonness with the shared historical milieu, and go back to our freedom and agency in the in, uh, relational individual, and this is made possible by the Aidagala, this betweenness, this space. And from this process is emerging to the ethics, like in the definition of Watsuji. And there are two aspects here. Key aspect too is that um, as this conception of the self is very dynamic and ever changing, we, it's very adaptable. And I think that's a key thing that we need to develop uh, in order to, with the quick changes of the environment in the future. So we need to be ad adaptable, and this is one of the key for survival. Thank you very much. So we are now open for 10 minutes discussion. Or actually, Takeshi told me that we can have a longer time, even longer time, if, uh, I'm, uh, if there are many questions. Hi, please. Hi, Omam. Okay, uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I have one question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, problems concerning sustainability. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the uh, spatial distance, temporal distance, and so on and so forth. But uh, what I mm, wanted to hear as well before looking at the, the problems is uh, kind of the maybe definition of sustainability. Yes. How do you understand uh, w what is the meaning of sustainability as you use it in your presentation? Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, for example, in the Japanese context, I'm sure you know that uh, to, to render this English word, they uh, use, uh, on the one hand, sustainability and jizoku kago na. And they seem to be interchangeable, but they're actually not. And there's a lot of uh, views. And you seem to touch on 
um, the idea of being sustainable at a local level, but also on a global level. Mm -hmm. And do you refer to both? And uh, if you could clarify that. Yeah. So I think I refer to both because the local sustainability is needed for the global sustainability, right? And uh, in fact, I'm referring to the um, definition by Paul Thompson of sustainability mm -hmm. as to keep the um, but the environment to use the, the resources of the environment as a rate which allow its self regeneration and keeping also the significance. And I'm also crossing this with the social sustainability because one is not going without the other, right? Uh, from Amatya Sen. That's kind of the background I, I have here. But it's very, in fact, I'm linking very much sustainability to survival of human species. So at a very, I mean, global and maybe long term scale. I have a question concerning the historical milieu. Um, I mean, on the on the level of social relations, you were introducing kind of a couple of corrections to Vatsuji to ensure that extant social relationships are not maintained just because they are there. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't it make sense to say a similar thing about the milieu? To say that we have historically shaped milieus that we may not want to keep? Um, so conceptually we need a space and criteria to say what are the kinds of significance that we want to maintain in the milieu and what are the ones that we may want to change. Mm -hmm. uh, because we need to be able to think about not only conserving the environment but creating um, even like richer cultural and biological environments. And that's um, the concept that we need. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting, and I think I need to dig more on this. Um, yeah, I, I think, of course, I'm, I'm criticizing one of the interpretations of the milieu, right? The scientific one, or not, I mean, uh, with, as objectified resources on the, detached from our uh, life. And this is also an interpretation of the milieu. So I'm criticizing it. On, so maybe what is underlying here is to have an interpretation which is acknowledging the interdependence, both for meaning but also for subsistence. So, yeah, but I haven't yet elaborated in criteria to, to judge or to define. That would be a very interesting next step. Thank you very much. Mm. If, is there any question? If there is no, then I'd like to... Uh, Make a question by myself. Uh, is it okay? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, because I'm working on quite uh, like a yeah similar topic, so um, I'm really like happy to have yeah like colleague to work on the same the simulation. Um, my my question is. So how do you think the um, about the good and evil in the change of environment? Like um, um, I'd like to ask you the standard of good and evil in our actions, which change in which changes environment. I mean, so how much we are allowed to change our environment? Like. Um, can we cut, if we cut the tree in front of this house, but, okay, hole, um, is it allowed? Or, I, I mean, how can we <coughs> determine the good or evil of this action? And, uh, and who decides this, uh, like, the value of our vision? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. So um, 
it's linked with what uh, you said before, I think. I, I really think that sustainability needs to be natural and social at the same time. And so I think that in order to have social sustainability, we need stability. And if we need stability, we need kind of, not, not necessarily democracy, maybe another system, but where people can express their opinion. So when you ask who decide, I'm trying to interest, be interested in the self here, because I think it has to be not top down. So it cannot be the government deciding to cut the tree or not. I think it needs to be the people living and attached to the tree and using the space around the tree to decide um, if we, they need to cut the tree or not. So it's very particularism, right? It's not a top-down normative approach. Because I think that any top-down normative approach will, will meet with some kind of rebellion. And so it's kind of be sustainable on a social level. Then good evil standard, I face the same problem, in fact. Because who will decide what is good and what is evil? It's very difficult. So I would tend to say that it's the people leaving the space again who <coughs> could decide either of cutting the tree or not. And if these uh, individuals, they, they um, acknowledge their interdependence and they are aware of, well, of this interdependence, of this relationality as, as the basis of who they are, I think they will not take decisions which are, for example, uh, very egoistic, like cutting all the tree in their area and moving somewhere else or something like this. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. But I got yeah, what you mean. Mm. Mm. It's a very difficult question, and I have always this question too from uh, lawyers. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, is it your opinion comes from what is this ethics, or do you refer to what is this like standard of good and evil, or? So, or your mm. so, yeah, so what I really appreciate in Watsuji is the idea of cyclicity of the self mm -hmm. and also the idea of ethics as emerging from the relation, right? So not as top-down again, but it's kind of bottom-up ethical perspective, right? Which is emerging from the fact that we are together. And mm -hmm. So... I don't know if it's answer. Okay, maybe yeah, we can yeah, discuss yeah. later. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, please. Uh, so I take it one very interesting idea of this milieu is that is that one social and let's say natural or environmental. Yeah. Uh, for example, you mentioned that you know, if we have a friend that lives in a milieu that we don't live in, by our love or attachment to that person, we can kind of vicariously in that milieu. But then I wonder, for example, in the age of social media, when the our social connectivity is problematic in various ways, then how does that affect our feeling of being in the globe or being connected to other millions? Problematic in which way, for example? Uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, the sort of thinking to uh, Professor Heisig's uh, keynote, the uh, indirectness of it. I think he was, he was saying that all social, all social uh, as I took it, all social connections are indirect in the sense, social media even more indirect than uh, just face-to-face uh, -face relationships, yeah. but that natural relationships are the only direct ones we have. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so I haven't thought deeply about this problem, but I, I think like social media, they are a um, medium, well, it's obvious, maybe. So uh, we can have a very intense um, and close relationship through social media too. So it's more like a tool that can be used both ways. So maybe... As I see it, it, it can be more a help of keeping in touch with people who are far away from us and thus to continue to care for what's happening there because also we know more from what's happening there, maybe. But it's also, yeah, I mean, the huge debate that's had. Is it censoring or what? Yes, actually, if I may uh, 
should clarify something. Uh, I think that what I'm trying to say is very similar to what Professor Steinbeck said. Basically, uh, that the um, connectivity of Domilio is a kind of ontological basis, uh, but it is also historically and socially determined. Mm -hmm. So we can't exactly take the existing uh, milieu or the ways that we are connected for granted. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Maybe that's, that's the part of the constructuality of the self. Also, as it's in ever-changing, it also means we have a responsibility of who we become. And this is linked with the technique of the self, and in Japanese philosophy, it's always there, right? The kata, I'm working on who I become, training, and so on. And so I think that's um, an exercise for all of us as individuals to try to rethink about our conception of the world, acknowledging this interdependency for both significance and subsistence. So it might be painful, <laughs> and it's not easy, but yeah. So that's how I, that's where I see ethics too. Not, I don't see ethics as an action, but I see ethics as uh, who we become. So, thank you. But we can discuss more. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we, because we have second presenter, so yeah, maybe we can discuss more after. The, yeah, second presentation.